Hello, and thanks for listening to the Adulting is Easy podcast, where we make adulting easier by making money easier. This is Lauren, and I manage and host the Adulting is Easy blog and podcast at realadultingiseasy.com and anywhere you listen to podcasts, pretty much. Please, if you can, hit the follow button. That helps me out a lot. I'm joined today by Jesse Kramer, the founder of The Best Interest, an investing blog with over 500,000 readers since 2018. He works full-time in wealth management in Rochester, New York, where he lives with his fiance and their foster dogs. Thanks for joining me, Jesse. Hey, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Are you looking for a mortgage for a new home purchase? Look no further than Jasmine Mortgage Team. Jasmine Mortgage Team is licensed nationwide with competitive rates, excellent customer service, and has a solid reputation amongst home buyers, real estate agents, and financial advisors. Head on over to jasminemortgageteam.com and tell them Lauren from Adulting is Easy sent you. That's jasminemortgageteam.com. So Jesse, our goal for today is to make adulting a bit easier for listeners by discussing a personal finance topic since managing money is a big part of adulting. So today, Jesse, you're going to tell me about your kind of young investor clients, how they behave, questions they ask, and mistakes they make. When newer investors come to meet with you, what are they asking you to help them with kind of fundamentally? Newer investors, I mean, first things first, I'm going to bucket new investors into different age groups. Now, obviously, today we're going to focus on some of the younger new investors, but it is interesting. And and because I think Lauren and you and I are both younger, we skew younger, we think about younger people, we might not realize that some new investors are older. You know, I, I do work with some people who are near retirement. Maybe they're a small business owner. Their entire life, they've been turning their money back over into their business And now that they're selling their business to someone else, they're coming into a lot of money all at once. And they are a new investor because they just really haven't been investing before. They've always been focused on their business. Now, most people, though, who are new investors are are younger folks like us. And uh, for them, I really like to impart on them that they're in a building phase of their life. They should be saving more. They should be investing more. They should be investing in assets that are growing as opposed to investments that might be a little more stable, a little bit less risky. They should be looking for a little bit of investment risk, seeking out that investment reward. I like to talk to them that things shouldn't be too complicated. And oftentimes their investment strategy, it doesn't require too much expertise. Uh, It can definitely be nerve wracking. and, And there's a big psychological aspect of investing. And that's something that I find That's a big part of my job. It's a big part of my writing. Uh, It's explaining the whys and the hows of investing and and how it might feel to be an investor and a little bit of hand-holding, if you will. But um, one of the biggest things to to summarize for younger folks is that uh, the actual logistics aren't that complicated, but the hard part is really getting your mind in the right mind space. So are people coming to you primarily to think about retirement or is there any aspect where people are like, I want to make 10x between now and next year? Does that ever happen? It does. It really does. Now, if they want to make 10x between now and next year, usually that conversation has to go down a path where I try to educate them on why that might not be a realistic goal. Hate to say it, but let's talk, you know, you got to be facts or facts. You got to be real. But I do have plenty of people who will come to me with goals that are different than retirement saving. One of the big things that we do, one of the investment philosophies we have where I work is it's called goals-based investing. And the idea there is we talk about a client's goals. We assign a time or a due date for those goals. A big one is retirement, obviously, but maybe someone's goal is, hey, uh, 10 years from now, I want to buy my dream house. It's here in the Finger Lakes near Rochester, New York. Uh, it's going to cost about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So ten years from now, I need seven hundred fifty grand to buy this house. So that's that's a goal that's completely different than retirement. But because we have a dollar amount, because we have a timeline, ten years from now, we know how much risk we can essentially assign to that client, or how much risk that client can take with their investments, such that they have a good probability of of growing their money between now and then but there's not so much risk involved that there's a high probability of them losing a lot of money by the time 10 years comes around. So to answer your question once more, Lauren, goals and timelines are huge and in my opinion should be a part of of every investing conversation. 
Do you ever find that people's goals and the amount of risk that they need to take to basically achieve these goals is not in alignment? Yes, certainly. Certainly. That's a huge part of investor education. And it's a huge part of investor education that you and I see, Lauren, on, say, Twitter that we see for free. And it's one of the awesome things, in my opinion, that's come out of the last, say, uh, 10, 15 years of the internet is there's so much phenomenal investor education out there for free. And I do think one of the big problems that a lot of young investors have is that large disparity, that large valley between what their sunshine optimistic goals are and what the more, say, realistic brass tax reality is. And to some extent, a very few people think about the pessimistic side. You know, in my opinion, an investor should have all three in mind. If everything goes perfectly well, where can I be in 10, 20, 30 years? If things go really badly, where might I be in 10, 20, 30 years? And say, based on historical averages, if, if, I, just get, if I just get average results for the next few decades, where will I be? A lot of young investors that I've seen, they tend to focus on the rosy side, the optimistic side. Part of that is because our last, say, 10 years of stock market investing have been so good coming out of the great financial crisis in 2009 until essentially six months ago, we were in one of the greatest bull markets of all time. Simultaneous to that, we had the advent of cryptocurrency, which I think we're going to talk about later this episode, Lauren. And, and cryptocurrency headlines have made people believe that it's pretty easy to build large sums of money with very little work or very little downside. And so that mix has led people over the past few years to be very optimistic about investing. So when someone new comes to me, that's their backdrop. And so it's pretty understandable why they might be that, that optimistic. How can you tell when someone can take on the kind of risk that is needed to accomplish their goals versus if they can't? A lot of that, Lauren, it has to do with the cash flow that they're choosing to invest. It has to do with their income. It has to do with their spending needs. Um, it has to do with their personal psychological makeup, some of which you never really find out until something bad happens. And what I mean by that is it's very easy for me to ask you, Lauren, or to ask one of your listeners, hey, if your portfolio dropped by 40 or 50%, would you be willing to stay the course and stick with your investments? Uh, some people there would say, yeah, I, I, think I, can, I think I can handle that. Great. Well, people said that in 2006. And then when 2008 came along and their million-dollar stock portfolio did get cut in half to $500,000, some people said, oh, well, when the question was theoretical, my answer was, I can handle it. But now that it's real, I cannot handle this. That's bad. So we like to ask a lot of questions to try to get at the truth of what someone's psychological makeup is and, and if they really can handle the ups and downs of the market. But sometimes you don't find out until you're in the middle of something, in the middle of something bad, that is, and you realize that you do need to adjust their portfolio. But the biggest and best preventative measure there, Lauren, is diversification. And even with the youngest, most ambitious investors, um, I don't believe that, say, a 100% stock portfolio is the right portfolio. Uh, there might be exceptions, but for the vast majority of investors of any age, having some diversification between various levels of risk, various levels of reward, uh, some anti-correlation where some assets go up while other assets go down, it generally provides a, a less bumpy ride in the investment markets, a more smooth ride. And that smooth ride is the thing that's going to enable people to stick with their investments over the long term. Yeah, that makes sense. And I was talking about this with my husband, I don't know, six months ago. And I said, there are so many adults that have been in their careers for quite some time at this point that are around 30, low 30s, that have never really viscerally experienced a big downturn. We had the blip right? We had the blip of March 2020, where we had a recession for a month, we had like a, a bear market for a month or whatever. But if you take that out of the equation, we've all kind of gotten used to these 
kind of absurd almost returns in this like bull market of bull markets. And something that has happened in 2022, as there's been a slide in stocks is I've been looking at my real estate like, whoo, okay, at least that's still okay, right? And I think that's why diversification is important where our net worth has been level, if not has gone up a little bit in 2022. And we're able to say that because our, as our stocks have gone down, our real estate has gone up. We're not as diversified probably in our investment portfolio as we should be in terms of you know bonds. We don't have any commodities or things like that. But that is one thing that I have been really happy about. But it's interesting where you aren't really grateful for the diversification until until the kind of the crap hits the fan. Totally. I, that, that's a great story. That's a great personal story. And that conclusion you just said there, Lauren, I think that hits the nail on the head. It's one of those things in life. Um, it's a general a general quote about risk management is that risk management never becomes apparent until the times you need it most. And a lot of the times when risk management was working the way you expected it to, it's very easy to take it for granted. It's very easy to um, have your, I mean, I'm just thinking of a wild example here. I just spent a, a, a weekend at a lake. It's very easy to have your, say your boat capsize or, or, or be on a boat and be like, you know what? Yep. We've got life jackets. It, it doesn't really matter. Everything's fine. Nothing seems chaotic about the situation at all. But then if for whatever reason your boat does capsize and you have those life jackets, man, are you going to be happy you had them? It's very easy to overlook them the other 99% of the time. Uh, portfolio construction is largely the same. And it is kind of funny that some of the metaphors that we use a lot of the time for portfolio construction has to do with boats or the weather or safety nets or parachutes, that kind of thing. Because uh, diversification is one of those safety nets that helps people stay the course for the long run. Because listen, it, it's not fun to have 100% of your money in, uh, say, Amazon, which is an amazing company but then to see it drop 40% in one year. That is so wild too. A chiropractor I went to a few years ago, I asked him, this is what I was first getting into personal finance. Really weird thing to ask your chiropractor. But I was like, so where's your emergency <laughs> fund? He's like, oh, it's in Facebook stock. I was like, excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> like, I was like, wait, hold on. I don't know a lot about this, but I think that's not, you know, he's like, well, I can have it in five days if I need it or whatever. And I was like, mm -hmm. hey, that's not the point. The point is you could have a 20, 30% drop right when you need it. Um, totally. But, you know, hey, maybe he was that risk tolerant. I don't know. He went to a new practice before the Cambridge Analytica thing. So I never got to follow up with Interesting. Him, uh, how yeah. I was feeling then. But gosh, so speaking of that, I guess, what are some mistakes that you see new investors making? And, and this can be obviously of any age, but people are kind of just getting into investing. Are there any mistakes that you're kind of seeing over and over? I ask so listeners can maybe avoid some of these. There are, understandably so. The, one of the biggest mistakes that I see, it probably has something to do with headline chasing. You know, if, if I were to give it a diagnosis of, of why I see it so much, but essentially it'll be a newer investor saying, uh, what are the hot stock picks? Or I want you to help me invest my money. Pick the hot stocks. Pick the stock that's going to 10x over the next six months. Uh, pick the crypto coin that's going to 10x over the next six months. People want some sort of secret knowledge or that they're convinced that there is secret knowledge out there and that because I write about investing all the time, because I work for a wealth management firm, that we must have that secret investing knowledge and, and that's what they want. When the truth is, if we had the secret investing knowledge, we would be making so much money hand over fist and, and anybody who had the secret knowledge would be making that much money hand over fist, right? If the investment industry knew which stocks were going to 10x in the next six months, everyone would be getting filthy rich. The truth is, it's very difficult to pick individual stocks. It's especially difficult to pick individual stocks over a short time duration. You know, people talk about Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett made his initial money, say, in the first two decades of his career, picking undervalued individual stocks. That is absolutely true. He also had multi-year timelines with those stocks, you know, four, six, 10-year timelines. He looked at the stock market and said, ABC stock seems to be trading far below its book value right now. I'm going to buy it. And I'm going to trust that at some point over the next decade, the market is going to find its rationality again 
and price that stock appropriately. So it's a very logical way of investing. He didn't say, I'm going to scour Silicon Valley looking for that one startup that's going to pop and 100x its stock value over the next year. Nobody, to my knowledge, can, can realistically do that. Um, when it does happen, for example, say GameStop or AMC or any one of the cryptocurrencies that we've seen, it's almost always happening for irrational reasons, reasons that don't have any basis in fact, that instead have basis in market psychology, uh, in, in, in market participants, traders acting irrationally. And the problem with that is it's very hard to be repeatable, right? If, if you have to rely on people making stupid decisions in order for you to make money, it's hard to be repeatably correct about something where other people are being stupid. It's easier to be repeatably correct about some sort of long-term rational decision. And that's something that you, newer investors sometimes don't want to accept. They, they want the truth to be, I'm going to make a ton of money in the next six months. I just need to know how. And something that I see too, maybe on Twitter, just around is people think, okay, I'm going to do some Googling, right? Maybe read some financial reports, read some news. And I'm going to, if I do that, if I just spend a little bit of time doing some research, then I will be able to beat the stock market. Everybody that's buying index funds, they don't, they're just not, they're not taking the time to do the research to buy individual stocks. And what people don't understand is typically that information is already factored into the price of the stock. And if it was that easy, then it wouldn't happen, right? It would happen for like one or two people and then boom, it would revert right back and all that information would be in there. So that's just something that I've been seeing too, where people, it seems like they think they're going to do like a slight amount of research and that's enough and they'll beat the market because other people aren't doing this research. Totally. You're, you're, that's, you hit the nail right on the head. And I think those people, they oftentimes forget the fact that there is some expert out there. There's actually a group of individual experts out there who are doing a hundred times better research than them and have a hundred times more knowledge than them. And they're the ones who are doing most of the active trading on individual stocks that set the price. So right, when, you're, when your uncle Dave wants to spend half an hour reading the quarterly update from Apple, I mean, yeah, th that's more research than you and I might be doing, Lauren. But compared to the Apple analysts in Wall Street who have millions, if not billions of assets on the line, uncle Dave doesn't know a damn thing. He just doesn't realize it. Exactly. Now, if it makes them think they're participating, I, I guess that's okay. But some of those people that even have hundreds of thousands of hours into this, they don't even beat the market. That's the thing. Like, so it, that's something that I, I just happen to notice is even the people who have the most up to date, the best knowledge in the world, they don't even usually beat the market. That is, that is correct. That is correct. There's a few cool stats out there. But uh, long story short, before you account for any sort of investment fees, it, it, it's not a 50-50 proposition to beat the market. It's actually more like a 30-70 or a 40-60 proposition to beat the market. And the reason why is there is because um, a small minority of stocks tend to greatly outperform the market and pull the average up. So unless you are able to pick that small minority of stocks, you're probably going to lose to the market. So beating the market isn't 50-50. And then once you account for investing fees, if you're going to pay some professional to, uh, to simply invest your money and, and not to get any sort of additional financial planning from them, well, now you're kind of starting behind the eight ball, so to speak, because you're, you're losing some money up front to those fees. Yeah, exactly. Those transaction costs. And that's the thing. You might pick that one stock that one time. Right. But year after mm -hmm. year after year, it's it's almost impossible to do. And we've, we've seen kind of people get exposed recently. Right. So you mentioned diversification and not having 100 percent stocks. I got to ask you, how much crypto should people be holding? <laughs> Great question. Uh, a very popular question that I've, you know, been asked plenty of times. And I really, I do have two answers and, and this is, I'm being honest here. I have two answers. I've got a, a professional answer and a personal answer, answer. The professional answer is zero because crypto is not a cash flowing asset. Um, we've seen how volatile it can be in the past few weeks. And listen, you don't have to swing at every pitch in investing. It's a great Warren Buffett quote. Investing is a no called strike 
game. And what that means is, well, let's think about where you get strikes called against you, baseball. If you sit there with your bat on your shoulder in baseball and let the pitches fly by, once you get three strikes, you're out. You can't play anymore. So by getting strikes called against you, you are incentivized to swing at anything close. But investing doesn't work that way. In investing, you can just let opportunities pass you by if you don't like them. And you can just sit there with your bat on your shoulder and only choose to swing at the small percentage of investment opportunities that really scream out to you that they're great, right? Investing is a no call strike game. You don't have to invest in crypto. And based on the fundamentals of crypto, what underlies it, and the volatility we've seen from a professional point of view, it's not wise to invest in crypto. Now, that said, I completely understand the allure of crypto, just like I understand the allure of owning gold or, or whatever commodity it might be. Uh, I understand that many inv investors will want to uh, say invest in, in different asset classes than what I do personally. So for those people, I would invoke John Bogle's rule, John Bogle being the founder of Vanguard, very famous investor. So John Bogle's rule was you should have less than 5% of your assets in your sandbox or in your play money. The other 95% should be in trusted, durable, long-term cash flowing assets. Use 5% to play around as you wish. I love that. And I love that you're just like, you know what? I have two answers for you. And do you know how many Warren Buffett quotes do you think you know off the top of your head? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I this is true. I'm, I'm training for a half marathon. I don't like listening to music when I run because it kind of amps me up too much. And I'll do two fast miles and then be exhausted for the rest of my run. So I really like listening to either podcasts or speeches or that kind of thing. And, you know. Scout's honor, I listen to a lot of Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meetings because they're like six hours long. I get to listen to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger answer questions. So the long-winded answer there, Lauren, is I think I know a lot of Warren Buffett quotes off the top of my head. <laughs> That's awesome. And I mean, he's, you know, one of the greatest, if not the greatest investors of all time. So awesome to learn from him. How I, how I think about Warren Buffett is I'm just not him. Right. Like, mm -hmm. who is mm -hmm. him? It's like it's like trying to p play basketball, be LeBron. You know, I just. I, everybody's like, that's kind of their example. Well, Warren Buffett did it. OK, well, are you Warren Buffett? Um, you know, I just <laughs> right. I don't think so. I really don't right. think so. There's been a lot. Yeah, obviously, inflation's happening. And basically what that means, if you had a hundred dollars of cash last year, it's worth like eight dollars and 60 cents less now than it was then because we've had an 8.6 inflation rate over the last year. So cash has suddenly become sort of this almost divisive topic. How much cash should you have? It's part of your diversification. It's part of your emergency fund. But what's, what's your take on that right now? Mm -hmm. Cash in an emergency fund, you know, when you mentioned emergency funds earlier, I thought about saying this then, but instead I'll say it now. In my opinion, both personally and professionally, your emergency fund should be cash. It should be liquid. It should be sitting in a bank account, say a high yield bank account where it's making whatever interest rates are right now, 0.8, 0.9% per year. It's not great. And it's a known loss. You know ahead of time that your cash is going to sit there. And yes, it's going to lose value to inflation and that stinks, but that's the price that you have to pay to feel like you have that safety net underneath you, right? It's, it's, you're biting the bullet up front and you, and you just, you live with it because the alternative is, it was a great example you mentioned before, Lauren, of your, the, the chiropractor who had his emergency fund in Facebook. The problem there is this chiropractor said, well, listen, even if Facebook drops 50%, I'll still be fine. I'll still have enough money in my emergency fund. Well, I want to call a timeout on that. To me, that means that his true emergency fund isn't the full amount. His true emergency fund is that 50% number. And what he should do is take the upper 50% that he doesn't really need and do whatever the hell he wants with that. Invest that in Facebook. But the bottom 50% that he's worried about, that 50% that, that he wouldn't want the stock to drop any lower, that ought to be in a, a liquid asset that's very dependable. 
and and that's cash. It, it's going to lose some value over time to inflation, and and that does stink. You might have to pad that emergency fund over time with some extra savings, but it doesn't have nearly the volatility that Facebook does. And uh, it's a it's a, it's an interesting topic for debate. I know there's been a lot of debate on social media that I've been a part of on whether to have your emergency fund in cash. But that's what I say. I, I do think it needs to be in cash, and and that's exactly why. So inflation is not a called strike. Uh, that's a good question. Inflation is not a called strike. It might be if we think about it in that metaphor. It it might be the kind of thing where inflation is going to happen to you. Uh, you don't know exactly in what magnitude. And over this past year, unfortunately, we've seen quite a high magnitude. Um, it might be one called strike that that you know is going to count against you in some form or fashion. It's just something that you're you're allowed to plan for fairly easily. Not, not incredibly easy. You know, we've seen this year that it's been frustrating for many people having to deal with higher inflation. But if you know that it's coming ahead of time in some magnitude, you can plan for it. And and having that ability to plan is really, really valuable. Right. I guess the pitcher's kind of telling you it's coming, right? Essentially, so. right, right. Or, you know, <laughs> you're, you're going up to bat with a, an 0 1 count. You already have one strike against you, but then the ump says, I'm not going to call any more strikes against you. There okay. You go. That's not bad. <laughs> oh, I love baseball. Um, <laughs> so, so that covers inflation a little bit. What about quote unquote dry powder? What I've been struggling with, and I've seen this a little bit, where in market dips, people are like, okay, I'm going to dial down my 401k to dial up my cash. And that seems hard because basically your 401k, if you continue to dollar cost average, you'd be buying your stocks at a discount. And instead you're going to cash, which is depreciating, right? So mm-hmm, what are people mm-hmm. like, what are, like, what's kind of the general thought or are people asking you that question of, should I have cash so that I can pounce on investment opportunities later? Awesome question. And it's it's a great question that really comes from beginners and more experienced investors alike. And there's a few different ways to answer the question, but I won't bury the lead. All the ways to answer the question point towards a similar answer. Dry powder is usually a bad idea. And real quick for any super new listeners, the idea of dry powder, as, as Lauren said, was this idea that you have cash sitting on the sidelines ready to deploy when opportunity presents itself. And the problem there is, well, there's the problems a few fold. We could, for example, we could look at the history of say the stock market. That's a very common thing to do. We look at the history of the stock market and we say, if an investor had uh, followed some systematic dry powder strategy, where say they keep, they keep 10% 10% of their money in cash at all times. And when the stock market drops by 20% of its all-time high, boom, they deploy the dry powder and invest. You can look at any sort of buy the dip strategy. It's another name for a dry powder strategy, buy the dip. Every single buy the dip strategy over the stock market's history has underperformed simple dollar cost averaging. Every single one doesn't matter whether you're buying 1% dips or 5% dips or 10% dips. They all underperform dollar cost averaging. The reason why is because in general, the stock market goes up more than it goes down. And so while your money is sitting in cash, losing real value to inflation, the stock market has been more likely to run away from you than it has to drop as you would want it to. So that's really the basic argument against dry powder. Maybe you could make an argument to say, well, when stocks are overvalued based on, say, a price to earnings ratio metric, maybe then you could um, defend a dry powder, a dry powder stance. But really, at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is, uh, Lauren, is, is timing the market, right? A dry powder strategy is market timing. You are saying, I believe that holding cash right now is good because the market is going to go down, not up. That's market timing. And and market timing is really hard to do. Right. For all those reasons we talked about earlier, right? Everything yeah, exactly. is basically factored in. And if these people on Wall Street with their PhDs in finance and they're 
top of the line software and research and all of that, if they're beating the market one or two percent of the time, then why do I think I can do that with this dry powder situation? Totally. Um, what I'm personally doing, I'm going to a little more cash, but in a sense of I'm, I look at it as I'm not going to dry powder. I'm beefing up my emergency fund so that in a year or so, when I step away from my full-time job, we have a bigger emergency fund because we're more tied to what our real estate is doing and what is my husband's doing. So I feel like Mm -hmm. we're not going to have diversity of cash flow as much because we'll be losing, you know, losing a job. So, right. um, Right. And then I have to just convince my husband it's not dry powder. (laughs) <laughs> that it's emergency <laughs> well, fund money. <laughs> it totally makes sense to me. And right. And everyone's situation is different. The one thing I, I'll, I'll caveat my whole spiel a minute ago, that was specific to the stock market. And also it was specific to someone who's investing in, say, a broad index fund in the stock market. Uh, your situation, Lauren, is going to be completely different only because, you know, say real estate is a pretty big part of your portfolio. So you might want to keep some dry powder on hand because buying into a real estate deal takes significantly more money than, say, buying another share of VTSAX, right? So maybe dry powder makes more sense for you. Uh, It's funny, we were also talking about Warren Buffett earlier. Very famously, Warren Buffett has been sitting on, no joke, hundreds of billions of dollars of dry powder for the last few years. Why? Well, because Warren Buffett usually invests in entire companies, he will buy outright. He just bought an energy company a few months ago, Chesapeake, for I think 12 or $14 billion. So for Warren Buffett, he is very, very smart, as we know. He's a very, very good investor, as we know. He knows way more than you or I. He can hold on to dry powder because he's really smart. For the average, quote unquote, dumb investor, and I don't mean that as an insult, I consider myself a dumb investor, it doesn't make sense for us to hold on to dry powder. Yeah, totally agree. And that you make a good point about like the magnitude of cash, right? If we want to do a real estate deal, we need basically as an investor, you need 20% down. If the average price of a home or a duplex or whatever is $400,000, we need a hundred grand to be able to do that. So, but I don't, I don't know. That's not dry powder. That's me saving for a down payment. That's that, right, you know, right. I'm not, that's just me. I can't do a deal right now. I, I will do a deal as soon as I can do a deal. I'm not waiting to do one, right? Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you to, what advice do you have for people that right now are kind of getting into investing and maybe don't have a hundred thousand dollars net worth yet, and maybe they're hearing a hundred thousand dollars net worth. Like once you hit that, everything gets a little bit easier. What advice do you have for them right now? Great question. I would always want to sit down and ask someone like an hour's worth of questions to to really try to dig into their scenario. In general, that's a good practice, but. Listen, it's hard to do that. It does take a lot of effort. So there are some general rules. I sat down with, I think it was a 50, I think he was 59. I sat down with a 59-year-old a few weeks ago. He had about $200,000 net worth outside of his home equity. And the advice I gave him was significantly different than the advice I give, say, a 35 or a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old who had 200000 or $100,000 in net worth. So I just want to make that clear. But let's assume this person that we're talking about, Lauren, has $100,000 and they're at least 20 years away from their retirement date. So they have a long timeline ahead of them. The straightforward advice that I would give them is you are in accumulation mode. That person needs to spend less if they can afford to, they need to save more, and they need to measure that using a budget. Uh, Telling someone to budget, it's kind of like telling someone fewer donuts, more bananas, because the first response they have is, duh. Uh, The second response they have is, that's too simple for it to be effective. And the third response is usually, well, I, I already kind of do that. And to which I say, yes, duh, that it is simple advice. Uh, It's great advice because it is so simple and no offense, but most people aren't doing that. You know, eating two bananas and then also eating two donuts for breakfast is not following bananas over donuts advice. It's just not following that, you know, balance doesn't count. Uh, And a lot of people I talk to, they might write down a budget. They might have an idea of what they spend in a given month, but they don't really follow their budget or or they aren't very uh, detailed with it. And to me, that's that's not quite good enough if you really want to spend more, I'm sorry, spend less and save more. 
couple other things for the the lower, say the, the hundred thousand dollar net worth person, uh, focus on earning more. It's easy advice. I see a lot of people saying it, but frequently what that actually means is investing in yourself in some form or fashion. It can be professional development, self-education, investing in relationships is huge. Uh, someone who has 20 or 30 years left has tons of time to plant seeds in their career, water those seeds, and hope something really productive grows out of it. And by that, uh, that increased earning power is going to be huge over the long run of their career. And then the final bit of advice would be to invest accordingly, invest according to that long timeline you have. So that's going to mean, for example, in a traditional stock bond portfolio, way more stocks than bonds because you have two or three decades in front of you. It might mean investing in real estate. And Lauren, you know a ton about this. You know more than I do. But from what I see, investing in real estate is probably a longer term play. Sometimes the market might cooperate with you and you can do a quick flip. But a lot of times it's you buy, you renovate. You rent out for a number of years, you cash flow it, and eventually you might sell it and, and realize this large gain. But um, so that's the final advice is all for the investor. Maintain that long term zoom out view on your investments. Well said. And real estate's definitely a long, longer term play. <laughs> right. Even okay. if on good, a spreadsheet, <laughs> even if on a spreadsheet it works out kind of short term. What I have found and what I've seen around me is it takes at least a few deals before things stabilize. Maybe on paper, your place is going to cash flow $200 per door, right? But all it mm -hmm. takes is one bad HVAC compressor and you're knocked out for 10 months, right? So, or, you know, however long, six months, something like that. So it takes time for you to kind of even get the maintenance in place and get the CapEx saved and do kind of everything you need to do with a property. And I've heard this from Tom, the frugal gay too. He says it's about five properties. So just because something cash flows on paper, it takes a little while. And we're seeing that with, with our business. It's just going to take a couple of years until we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, actually generating cash, which is why hmm. I'm taking a new full-time job. Uh, <laughs> so Jesse, is there anything else you'd like to add before you wrap up? I don't think so, Lauren. I mean, thank you so much for letting me come on here. I feel like I did a lot of talking, but hopefully, hopefully most of it was good. So, so thank you. No, oh, awesome. Super valuable. And that's, that's my job is to get you talking. Um, <laughs> so why don't you tell people how to get in touch with you? Sure. So probably the best way is they can visit my blog. The address is bestinterest.blog. I've got approaching in on 5,000 weekly newsletter readers. So you can sign up for my email right there on the, the homepage of the blog. And if you're a social media person, you can also find me on Twitter and on Instagram. All right. I'll put that in the show notes as well. I can totally vouch for the newsletter. It's great. Oh, thank you. You all can follow me on Twitter at Adulting is Easy. You can email me at realadultingiseasy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Hopefully, Jesse and I have made adulting a little easier for you.